Welcome to Organic Politics. There's a satisfaction, isn't there, to, to doing it yourself rather than Yeah, I it. think that most things, you know, it's like that. And it's amazing just seeing the transformation. It's beautiful. Mm. You know, I mean, you go from this to yeah. something really beautiful and functional. And, you know, working with the hands is very, um, very therapeutic. Rudolf Steiner has a, a, a booklet called Handwork, and he really promotes the uh, importance of working with your hands and doing crafts. And the, uh, the stored memory that's, yep. that's in doing this, repetitive motions. I think also just, you know, making stuff is empowering. Mm -hmm. Feels good. Especially using what in some places is a waste product, you know, like just plant stalks. Mm -hmm. um, I want to start incorporating invasive wild plants into the paper making. Japanese knotweed? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. People are starting to eat it. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. The time of my hair was like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I was thinking we could we could sell hair extensions. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, hemp hair extensions. I'll vegan buy one. Hair. Oh, last forever. Uh -huh. Vegan, vegan. Yeah. <laughs> Put crystals in there. That's a, yeah. you, were, you were looking for ideas. <laughs> She's much better at this than I am. No, I'm <laughs> down. <laughs> well, and Mike was saying that we don't oh, we really have to use this for everything. Depends on how fine you want it, but you know it does create more of that. Mm -hmm. um, more of this, but it's not going to waste because we're going to make paper with it. So. Mm -hmm. We're here in Kentucky. We are. What's going on? Well, this is where the hemp is being grown. And, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to ship it all over. So we need to have the processing as local as possible. So, they you came, know the action is. <laughs> you came here where the action is. Yeah. yeah. It's great. It's amazing uh, actually being in hemp fields and, and seeing, having the plants, the fresh plants to work with, you know, because in Canada they're growing mostly for seed, they're making oil and protein powder, 
but they don't have the processing infrastructure to do anything with the fiber. So there, there are bales of hemp fiber that have been sitting around for over six years. It's ridiculous. Uh, and I had gotten some from, from a farmer in Canada to work with. And then I hooked up with the Kentucky farmers when they started growing it. And uh, all I want to do is use Kentucky fiber now. So, so these are the, the greeting cards. This is how it really started. Um, my inspiration is nature and connecting people to nature and experiencing the healing that we receive when we connect. Um, and, you know, part of that healing... Part of what's really important in our healing is not just including what's good for us, but also getting rid of the, the bad stuff, the chemicals and the toxicity. Um, and the, the paper industry is one of the largest causes of our water pollution. Um, you know, not even to mention the fact they're cutting down so many trees and destroying our air, our air quality as well. Um, so this is a, a greeting card made with a photograph that I took, and this is a blend of hemp and recycled post-consumer waste paper and it's beautiful paper but you know the fact that it's blended with uh, recycled uh, tree fibers means that it's not necessarily archival or acid free mm -hmm. so this is some hemp paper all of these are 100 percent hemp when I started out making paper, I was using Canadian hemp. And also, then I got some stuff from China. And then this is Kentucky hemp paper. So as you can see, it's pretty, pretty thin. I did some of them intentionally to be as thin as possible. Um, and then some are a little bit thicker. And then this one is really interesting. It has, you can see it's, it has a texture, it's thicker, almost like cardboard. So this is a blend of hemp herds and hemp fiber. I was trying to find 100% hemp paper, but I couldn't find it. Um, the company that I was ordering paper from told me that they couldn't make it. So then that just kind of, it ignited a fire in me and I decided to see how hard it is, you know. To make it. So Oregon, just like every other state, is very unique in what's happening there. We actually legalized the cultivation, possession, and production industrial hemp back in 2009 with Senate Bill 676. And unfortunately, um, it took you know almost five years for our Department of Agriculture to start working on implementing rules. So while the Farm Bill was very effective for a lot of states, what it took for Oregon was actually the Cole Memo that was issued on August 29th of 2013. And if you aren't familiar with that, the Cole Memo is a memo from James Cole, member of the Department of Justice, outlining eight enforcement priorities for states that had legalized marijuana. They didn't specifically say Colorado and Washington, but that's who they were targeting. Um, the U.S. Attorney Amanda Marshall for Oregon wrote a letter at the bequest of Congressman Earl Blumenauer, and she wrote that due to the federal definition of marijuana, industrial hemp is also included in this Cole Memo, and it, that applies at least for Oregon. So our Department of Agriculture uh, created a rules advisory committee. They began meeting in December of 2013. They met for a second time in January of 2014, and then February 7, 2014, the Farm Bill was passed, which included Section 7606, authorizing research by state departments of agriculture and institutions of higher education. Now, you would have thought that would have prompted the implementation of our rules, but everything kind of slowed down after that. And it actually took um, a farmer and I submitting an application requesting a license for the 2014 production season, which ultimately was denied, but to get the ball rolling again to see that there was significant interest in the state for actually getting this program up, um, you know, started and get some plants in the ground. So this past January of 2015, we actually had our rules finalized, and February 2nd was the very first license issued in Oregon to Edgar Winters. We had 13 licensees this year who were granted licenses, but we had significant issues with seed importation. So we actually only had nine farmers that planted this year. Um, speaking about the seeds, we, our law specifically says um, 
possession, production, and commerce in. So we don't have a specific research provision in our law. That doesn't mean that we're not doing research in Oregon. This is our very first production season. We don't know exactly you know, what's going to grow, how well it's going to grow, the water usage, fertilizer, et cetera. So what we are doing is, is research, but there is the potential for commercial cultivation in Oregon. So we, we were not able to get a DEA permit. Um, our Department of Agriculture was not. But also they were not as cooperative with facilitating seed importation as they could have been. One farmer did attempt to uh, import seeds and get his import permit with DEA, but that was denied and unfortunately the seeds were seized and destroyed. So like Colorado, we have a similar Wild West mentality of just getting the seeds however they can. And so these nine farmers were able to get seed. Most of them planted the minimum required two and a half acres that we have in Oregon. So going forward, we are working to amend our rules to reflect the program as the licensees would like to see it and hopefully having a more secure seed importation for next season. Hi, I'm Courtney Moran. I'm an industrial hemp attorney. I am based in Portland, Oregon with my firm Earthla LLCC, but I'm also licensed to practice in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And I have focused my education and my career on industrial hemp because it is an invaluable renewable resource that can provide so many benefits, not only to our environment and to public health, but to strengthen our economy as well. And it's this plant has so much potential and the community that has been created around this plant and trying to change regulations that don't make sense and that are impeding the development of this new industry is, is really incredible. And moving forward, um, we're going to be working together as a community to put in, into place sound policy that can actually build this industry and allow it to thrive. What is your vision for 25 years from now? What is your the, the optimum vision of what hemp could do for the U.S. 25 years from now? That every state will be cultivating in a capacity that is appropriate for them, that we will have products on shelves in every single state, and all across the board that we'll be using hemp for fuels, that we will be using it for our paper, using it for our clothing, have it as a staple of our food source because of the incredible health benefits um, from, this, from this plant. Mm -hmm. In terms of tools and renewable energy and, and sustainable energy, does it rank as a hammer, a screwdriver? Uh, where does it rank in terms of our tools with sustainability for... Uh, it's, well, it's an incredible tool. The capability of phytoremediation itself is, is amazing. Being able to clean up toxins in the soil with all the monocropping that we've been having and the use of GMOs and pesticides and fertilizers um, and herbicides that are produced from fossil fuels that are depleting the earth when we could be using a sustainable material that doesn't require these type of fossil fuel inputs, it's just, it's so beneficial. So not, I mean, phytoremediation is just the beginning. This crop, you know, it's uh, biodegradable. It can be made into so many different products that we're currently making from fossil fuels, such as plastics and our fuel, that it just makes sense that when we're realizing that we have a limited supply of fossil fuels and we have to find renewable alternatives, hemp isn't the only answer, but it is definitely part of this. Where do you see your career going? Do you see going into uh, politics? Do you see becoming, are you interested in being a trial lawyer? What is your interest as far as being a lawyer? Uh, I guess we'll just see where that takes me. Oh, the, the world is your oyster. The, so the universe is my oyster. Courtney, thank you for talking with Organic Politics. Thank you. Last year, uh, over 4,000 advocacy messages had gone out through the system that we were using. I think the goal is to get 10,000 messages to Congress about um, the Industrial Hemp Farming Act, Senate Bill 134, and HR 525. And eight states utilize our actual alert system for their specific state bills. And I want to um, really encourage you as an activist, if you are looking for resources and tools, to utilize me so that I can set up these actual alerts on your behalf. Here's a look at what we've got as far as um, legal hemp states in, in the map. Um, we have um, 26 
Although many would say, especially those who live in Washington State, that Washington State's Department of Agriculture does not really recognize that they are um, a hemp state, even though um, they are a recreational state via Initiative 502. Um, so that's um, an ongoing struggle there. The stars um, are indicating in 2014 which states were growing industrial hemp. So that was Colorado, Kentucky, and Vermont. And this year is the green stars, which is um, Oregon, North Dakota, Minnesota, Indiana, Tennessee, and Hawaii. And of course, back at it is Colorado, Kentucky, and Vermont. So we have um, nine states that do have industrial hemp growing, and that is fantastic. Um, a lot of these other states have contingencies within their bills um, that are either based on the federal government or something else that's not allowing them to go forward, whether that's appropriations or that the law does not actually um, force the Department of Agriculture to initiate the program. Um, and one key thing that we were able to do in my home state of Tennessee is make sure that the language said that the Department of Agriculture shall promulgate rules and regulations um, by an effective date. And that was one reason why we were absolutely able to engage our Department of Agriculture and move forward. Um, but we were also very blessed because our Department of Agriculture was um, very uh, friendly with this idea and some are not um, interested in industrial hemp yet. My name is Beate Kirnse. I'm from California. I'm originally from Germany, but I've been in California for a few years. I came across industrial hemp a few years ago, and I just got fascinated about the plant, its uses, but also its um, fate and history. So I got involved a little bit and um, read up more, and last year, my husband and I, we did an um, addition to our house, and we decided we wanted to use hempcrete just to make a point in California and to make a point to see if we even get it um, permitted and what it would take to actually build it. So um, it was quite the experience and we do have our hemp room now. It's, it's very comfortable, it's very exciting. It took us six months to get it permitted. We live in LA County, which is very conservative and very restrictive. Um, but we got it through six months. It took six months to get it permitted. Um, and we built it with people from all over the country. They came because they wanted to build with hemp. So that was very exciting. We had a lot of volunteers. And we even had a young contractor from Northern California who really wanted to build with hemp. So he came to Southern California and stayed with us for a few months to help us build our hemp room. And, and based on that, I, I also got um, involved more into the hemp industry. I saw that a lot of other states um, really got ahead of California, Kentucky, and, and, and Colorado, and Washington, and, and already growing hemp. And we in California, who are so progressive in many ways in our energy um, our models, in our building code, but it just seems we can't get it going for industrial hemp, which is such a sustainable um, material. So I really want to be part of it to um, build the hemp industry out in California that we actually grow hemp. So my goal is I want to see seeds in California into the ground by, by next spring. So I just founded an organization, it's called the um, California Hemp Foundation. And our uh, mission is to raise funding for research at California universities. And we already have one university. They, they have all the signatures, the dean, the president is behind it. We have a master's student who is very knowledgeable and, and um, wants to do the research program. And um, um, so my mission right now is with my board, to go with my board, to raise money to have this very first pilot project in California going by next spring. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Greta Gaines here, here with me and my hempery products at the Hemp Industries of America annual conference. I'm here because I really believe in cannabis and hemp. I grew up a ski racer in New Hampshire and Vermont. And now that I'm older and my joints are starting to bother me, I use CBD hemp. I rub hemp on the outside of my joints. I'm a big believer in the plant and how it can help in aging, especially for former athletes who are kind of creaky when they walk up the stairs.
So you have a business here. Yes, the Hempery is a business um, that I started about five years ago. We make everything with hemp seed oil, coconut oil, lavender, all essential oils. And the star, the rock star of the line is hemp seed oil. I believe if you put it all over every day, it really helps with anti-aging, maybe even anti-cancer. It can replace 10 or 15 things that are in your medicine cabinet that maybe you don't need, because hemp is just a great catch-all for all kinds of things. Troubled skin, dry skin, angry skin. Uh, you should try some, you might get hooked. So where, where is your business now? My, I live in Nashville, Tennessee now with my husband and my two children. Uh, we manufacture out of Chattanooga. The company, the parent company is out of Colorado Springs. And we are branching out across America. We have nine retail outlets now and we're at thehempery.com. Can you grow in Tennessee now? What's the status of hemp in Tennessee? As of last year, we have a hemp mill in the state of Tennessee. Our very first hemp crop, only about 50 farmers are growing. So we'll see how this crop ends up this month. It'll get harvested and um, hopefully we'll just start growing year after year more and more and return hemp to um, its native soil in Tennessee. Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, that's kind of the heart of the hemp belt. A hundred years ago, America was founded on hemp. We won our independence with hemp and it's time to bring this incredible crop back to the United States. So uh, tell us a little bit about your products. This is the Hempery Miracle Oil. I call it the Tabasco of skincare. It's just three simple ingredients. It is hemp seed oil, coconut oil, and essential oil of lavender. All three of those oils are incredible for the skin. I'm studying Ayurvedic medicine right now, and in Ayurveda, they use oil for so much of their panchakarma and their detoxing. Americans aren't used to putting oil as much on the skin, but it's incredible. It's good for acne. You wouldn't think it would work for acne, but it's good for psoriasis, eczema, any kind of fungal thing, bug bites. Um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful panacea for the skin. Um, my name is Al Warner. I'm the founder and CEO of Cannabis Basics. I'm not an ND, an MD, a scientist, an herbalist, or even an esthetician. What I am is somebody that's been formulating with cannabis for 20 years. So 150, 100 to 150 years ago, half of all the medicine sold in the United States, with no fear of a tie, uh, were made from cannabis. And uh, many of those applications were topicals. And this is a, a life liniment for beast and man. I just love the visual on this one. Mm. So this is a 1926 U.S. pharmacopoeia. There were a hundred different illnesses listed in the pharmacopoeia. Um, and then a short, you know, 1942, there, it was, cannabis was completely removed from the pharmacopoeia. So now on to, I, I just have to take a moment to pay respects to, to the hemp heroes that really laid the foundation for me. And first off, it was Jack Herrera. I walked into the Fremont Hemp Company in 1994 and picked up this book and my life would never be the same, basically. <laughs> then we have Donnie Work Chapter, and why, the reason why Donnie is so significant is, first of all, he opened the first hemp store in the country, but Donnie was the first to import seed and press them for seed oil, which we all started to formulate with. Then I've got three guys that Jeffrey Stonehill is no longer in the industry, but he had a company called All Around the World Hemp. Then there's Ryan Halliday. He actually has Hemp Organics, which is probably the only true cosmetic company in the industry. And then we've got Jerry Shapiro of Mary Hempsters. Why these guys are significant, these guys were so willing to share their knowledge with me. They were also willing to help me buy the first, the first fertile oil that we had came from Inner Mongolia, and it was with their help that I was able to get on the, in the, those purchases and formulate with that oil that was now fertile instead of sterilized. Dr. Bronner's and David Bronner. You know, after 50 years of a successful company, um, David championed the, you know, moving into the hemp space, and we are all better for it. You know, they, they supported the HIA to fight the DEA, DEA for the 2003 hemp appeal, and then, of course, you know, he did a, a lot of other outrageous actions that helped us all, like, you know, cage himself in front of the, the White House. That was that. And then we've got Anita Roddick. And this was this woman was my personal hero. First of all, she was a woman, so that was different. This is the, um, the creator and owner of Body Shop. 
She's took a $7,000 investment and turned it into 600 retail stores. And what's more significant about that is she was the first one to really challenge the cosmetic industry, the very ugly cosmetic industry, and started the whole thing about fair trade and not testing in front of, testing on animals. So she's very, very significant. The, the product line that, I, that is award winning is my hemp seed oil line. And so I have six products that it's under Cannabis Basics and I can ship them across the state and uh, out of the country actually. And so it's been pretty monumental in the last two years, but the last year specifically, um, the odd thing is that I ran my company from 95 to 2007 and never made any money. It was just a passion. Um, it was more of a hobby that really, you know, I always had a second job and it was really um, difficult, but I was so in love with it that I just kept at it. And then about seven years ago, I closed my business because it was just, it was not time for hemp yet. And um, about three years ago, some friends of mine asked me to, to op help them open a dispensary. And because of that, because of getting involved in the medical marijuana space, I actually started looking at adding cannabinoids to my hemp products and then came up with something really spectacular. The hemp seed oil products alone are fantastic, but to add the cannabinoids to them, have, I've really got something on a different level. now. Now the country's ready for it. Now all of a sudden, the irony of it is that medical marijuana or recreational marijuana brought life back to my hemp company. We have Cannabis Health and Beauty Aids. Cannabis Health and Beauty Aids now adds cannabinoids to those products, but they're less than 0.3% THC. You would never ingest them and they would never cause an intoxication. So for those products, and then there are above 0.3% THC medical grade topicals. Now these, types of products that are highly concentrated with THC and other cannabinoids are going to be highly looked at by drug companies and they would be considered pharmaceutical, nutraceutical if you wish, and because they're ingested. But Cannabis Health and Beauty Aids with um, in 2136 Section 7, Washington State, last session, we just defined this category for the first time in our legal language and defined it as not marijuana and removed it from the Washington State Controlled Substances Act. Effectively moving it from the, removing it from the Washington State Controlled Substances Act even before we were able to get industrial hemp taken mm -hmm. out in mm -hmm. Washington State. We have medical marijuana, we have adult use marijuana, we have chaba to be sold anywhere, but we still don't have industrial hemp. But we're gonna fix that.